Dr. Klubensky, you know, we are what stands between the audience and lunch, so we have to put on a really good show, which we're going to try to do. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm honored to share the stage with you today, Dr. Klubensky. For those who are unaware, Mass General Brigham is a nonprofit integrated academic health system. It is the largest private employer in the state with 80, 82,000 employees and maintains a total research budget of more than $1.7 billion. Dr. Klubansky here became CEO in June 2019, and she has been leading the transformation of this health system during this unprecedented public health crisis. So Dr. Klubansky, the theme of this conference is Dear Future, we're coming for you. So I wanted to start there. What is your uh, vision of the future of Mass General Brigham? So Mass General Brigham uh, is an integrated academic healthcare system, and what we are looking at is what is the vision of that for the future. And just to start with a little bit about the system and what it is, we have these two magnificent founding hospitals, Mass General and Brigham and Women's Hospital. We also have specialty hospitals that are renowned. We have McLean and Psychiatry, Spalding for Rehabilitation, Mass Eye and Ear, and we have a network of community hospitals. So you look across the system and you look across these hospitals and we think about the future. The future has to be taking these hospitals, these different components of this system, and bringing it together to really create an integrated academic healthcare system of the future. What does that mean? So first it means defining where we need to be going and what we need to be leveraging. So if you look at who we are, what is our differentiator, what's our, I would say, distinguishing characteristic as a healthcare system, it is academic. And that means the academic mission, which is really the incredible research, it's the teaching, it's the innovation, it's the caring for communities, it's the highest level of care. These are the things that we hold dear. So what does that look like as we fast forward into what that means? Number one is it means taking what we have and having the most impact. So if you think about research, there has been this dichotomy between healthcare delivery innovation and academic or research innovation. And that has to be closed. If you think about where we need to go in the future, it's how do we have the most impact by taking the research, looking at that $2 billion base, looking at the over 300 companies that we've spun out. That's research, that's innovation. That defines the kind of tertiary and quaternary care that we deliver and need to be delivering. So it's leveraging that, it's taking that impact. And how do we push that out? Well, one way is to look at the continuum of care. Mm -hmm. So if you put this all together, if you create access to the system, then you really have an experience that begins in the home. And that gets beyond acute illness to thinking about health in a much broader way. So we start in the home, we move to community or ambulatory settings, we move to community hospitals, and then we get to our high end really specialty hospitals that are general hospitals, but really excel in tertiary and primary care. So putting this all together, creating the access to the system. And then if you think about the continuum of care, what care is delivered where? And I think this is a very important concept because it gets to how we have to rely on technologies, adopt them that are there, and then look to the future with other technologies. So traditionally, we think about these bricks and mortar systems and we need them. We deliver the highest acuity care in those bricks and mortar settings, buildings, people come to buildings. But as we think about the future and we think about access, and it's not just locally or regionally, it's nationally and beyond, how do we actually create that capacity using technology? And that is gonna be a very important factor in how we deliver care. So moving patients to the right place for care, delivering care lower to home, that's obviously gonna have huge impact on how we lower total medical expense. And many, many systems are doing that. But how do we also take that highest level of academic care, that research infused care, the innovative care, and not just have it at our AMCs, but put it out across the region and the country and beyond. So I wanna pick up on two things you said, the brick and mortar piece mm -hmm. and the lowering the total cost of care. So I hear that you are um, investing and, uh, in an expansion, a $1.9 billion expansion that will uh, include two patient towers. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about that. It seems like you're betting on brick and mortar when the 
ecosystem is going in the opposite direction, is doing digital, at home, virtual. Yes. So, so, so you highlight one of the really important things, which is the tower. So there are really two things that have to be going on simultaneously. This is not an either or discussion. So I'll start with the tower first. Mass General, that is uh, one of the premier uh, academic hospitals uh, in the country and beyond, and is obviously one of our two founding hospitals. If you look at that hospital, it's a facility that was built many, many, many years ago. And in fact, if you look at what we've learned during the pandemic and what we've learned about patient care and how to take care of patients, only about 30% of the rooms in that hospital are private rooms. So to think about having a hospital like this that we're looking at for the future that needs to be technology enabled, that needs to be able to provide flexibility, that needs to be resilient in an environmentally challenged city and time. How do we build that building of the future for those patients who need to be there? So I wanna stop for a minute because that gets to the question of who needs to be there and why we're looking at both or why aren't we looking at both. Who needs to be there if you look at innovation in healthcare, if you look at the kind of advanced therapeutics, diagnostics, devices, there will always be that virtual cycle of innovation. And there will always need to be a place for giving those highest level types of care in an academic setting. And that's Mass General, that's the Brigham. So the need to have that type of a setting, I feel will always be there. There will always be the next CAR-T therapy. And you have to look at the cycle of these therapeutics also, because there are those things that start in an academic medical center. They start in that highest level tertiary, quaternary acuity care setting. And then they move to the community hospitals. And then, then they're in ambulatory. And before you know it, they're delivered at home. But they have to start at that place. So there will always be a need, I think, for that facility. And it needs to be a facility that, again, is resilient and flexible and meeting the demands of patients now and into the future and is tech-enabled. Now, the second part has to be done in parallel. How do we shift care out of the hospital, thinking about where the future of healthcare is going for so many other patients who don't need to be in those facilities? Secondary care. Care is care that is gonna increasingly be, be delivered in ambulatory settings, and we're making a significant investment there. I have to, we have to get those patients out of those tertiary quaternary care hospitals who do not need to be there, move them into that secondary care, invest in ambulatory, and most importantly, invest, or as importantly, invest in healthcare at home. Mm -hmm. So we, we are just at the beginning of doing that, and I would just emphasize, patients want this, patients need this, patients expect the care close to home and in the home. We have so much of the technology there, we don't have all of it, but it is very fast paced right now and making investments in the technology infrastructure, really looking at what it means to provide digital health, not only will enable us will enable us to provide health care in a better, more cost-effective uh, way in the home for the patients who we serve now. But if you think about it, and I'll go back to the first point about the differentiator, the subspecialists that we have, the ability to have that highest level tertiary quaternary care, we can actually move a lot of that out, move that out in, into the country and beyond without having patients come to us. And I think that's, that's really the two things that we have to keep in mind, but it's not a choice of one versus the other. Fair enough. So in terms of patient experience, you talked in broad strokes about it. I'm wondering if there's anything specific you can point to uh, to say that this is something that we did during the pandemic that changes the patient experience and in this way. Yeah. So I think there are a couple of things, and I'll, I'll point to one of them. So, uh, and that's, that's really telehealth or televisits because it's a much more complicated topic. Um, I would just say it's not only what we learned during the pandemic of reaching different people living in different communities, how to reach them, how to engage them, how to provide care. Uh, I think, but it's also opened up a new avenue or a new avenue, not so much of thinking, but of adoption of how we think about health in the same way and get beyond the acute 
crisis that often brings people to the attention of healthcare providers or hospitals, but how do we think about this in a very different way of providing a continuum of health across a continuum of care? So what we learned during the pandemic was there was very, the technology per, for providing uh, telehealth or these visits, that was always there. That was there for a long time. But the adoption of it was very much delayed, and it, it really, I think, highlights the mindset and often the reluctance of change. Uh, and I would hear things like, it will disadvantage patients, it will reduce their experience. And of course, um, what you want, ideally, is, is a match between not only patients, but also providers. You wanna have a good experience of both. That is really the best experience, but always focusing on the patient. So what we learned during COVID is we stood up things so quickly and we went from really what was just a few thousand visits, virtual visits, into over several million visits in a very fast period of time. And I think we all learned a number of things. Number one is you didn't need a lot of incredible innovative technology, which by the way is going on all the time. You needed to just have an acceptance that this was an acceptable way to provide care and that it was so important and benefited patients. And that was the very important thing that we learned. Can all, there, there's, a, there's always been a kind of a binary question that's come up, which is not a very meaningful one. It's what do you lose when you provide these visits? It's not a binary choice. No, no one's choosing between all telehealth and coming in. Sure. You, the, the, the art of this, um, I think the deliberate and thoughtful discussion has to be around what it is that works in what setting. If you look at where we are right now, Many visits have gone back to in-person visits. There is such an opportunity, again, I will emphasize, many of the visits that take place in person have the potential to be delivered in the home. You need to put the technology in the home that will enable monitoring and other visits to occur. Are these technologies available? Many are available right now, but they just have to be used and used at broad scale. The one thing I would highlight that has been revolutionary in care during the pandemic that we learned from, to get to your question, is behavioral health. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of behavioral health visits are still being done using these technologies. And I think what it has done is it has shown so many fold over that a fundamental problem we have is access to care, access to care that is convenient, that is lowest cost, that can be delivered at home. These are really fundamental questions we're all grappling with. And what we learned for behavioral health, which is a Boston crisis, a Massachusetts crisis, a national crisis, and a global crisis, is there is an unquenchable need for access to behavioral health care. The entire spectrum of what comes under behavioral health is now really being viewed with the kind of attention and deliberateness that it needs to be. A lot of activity going on in the not-for-profit world, a lot of activity going on in the for-profit world, a lot of thinking about this from a payer perspective and a government perspective, and it's about time. So you mentioned access. I wanted to ask you about equity. Uh, yes. I don't think we need to go over the numbers. We do know the, the really stark numbers uh, uh, when it relates to how the pandemic treated people of color. How are you looking at this and what specific actions are you taking? So when we think about access uh, in, in the communities we serve, uh, we really are talking about access to all patients in the communities we serve. So the, the equity discussion started well, it's always been there, uh, obviously, like many things that came up during the pandemic. Uh, equity is an issue that has been fundamental in healthcare for a very long time. And I think the pandemic, as we know, just showed what it, what it looked like and the inequities that people have just viewed as that's the way it is for a long time, completely inconsistent with the delivery of care and access to care. So equitable access to care is a fundamental principle across Mass General Brigham. It needs to be a fundamental principle across all aspects of what it is we do and other healthcare systems and what everyone does. We did early on, we saw what was a, called a zip code analysis. And zip code analysis was interesting. 
uh, and, and thoughtfully done and highly significant. And what it really showed us is that access to care, COVID, so many things that we were learning in healthcare disparities could be traced according to zip code. So we learned so much, or we relearned so much, or so much that we knew is emphasized in terms of what it really meant to provide care in an equitable fashion. How do you access people across different communities? What are the language considerations? So we spent a lot of time on that. We also spent time, like other healthcare systems, we have a central portal that patients enter. We learned that many, many of our patients, particularly in underserved communities, couldn't access that portal. They didn't, have, they didn't have the computers, they didn't have the iPhones, they didn't have access to broadband, they didn't have a lot of things. So we started to do so much work in terms of translating, reaching out and partnering with communities in a very specific and deliberate way, looking at what community needs assessment were, using text messages, using all kinds of new modalities to reach people. But again, equitable access and what that means, what the patient experience is through that equity lens is really fundamental and it's fundamental to what we're working on in the future. So I, I want to push on this a little bit. I was at a panel yesterday and then also at dinner last night which, uh, where this issue came up that the data is there, but health systems do not want to know. They're afraid of what they might find out are we treating our African-American patients as well as we're treating other groups of patients? So how do you respond to that? So, so the question is, um, we are transparent about the data. Unless we learn from our patients, unless we see the data, we're not gonna make progress. Right. So we've taken a very, very hard look at all of our data, at what the patient experience is, of how patients are treated, according to all of these different criteria and understand that we need to tailor the patient experience and see what patients see. There is also a very important concept of racialized medicine. Mm -hmm. And we have an incredible team working on this across the system, looking at those things that are embedded in electronic healthcare records and systems that have actually used race in a way that fundamentally disadvantages people. It's not based on science. It's not based on things that we care about to move things forward. So taking a look at that, whether it's how one looks at GFR in patients with renal disease, there are so many different things that we need to take a look at through that lens so that the patient experience as a patient mm -hmm. And, and how that relates to health and how that relates to therapies, that's, that's, the, that's a next step that's being done. And it's, it's I think, uh, again, you're seeing a lot of this in our system. You're seeing a lot of this in national publications to which everyone will only say, yeah, it's about time. I mean, I'm hopeful. I mean, I feel like, you know, I've been covering healthcare for a while and it seemed like there was, you know, a system would hire an African-American chief diversity and inclusion yes. officer and the box was checked. It seems like we're going beyond uh, yeah. that level of lip service. So I want to share a slide with you and the audience. It's about price transparency. And when I first um, saw that slide, I was a little bit taken aback, although I have been covering healthcare for a really long time. You know, uh, for those who don't know, there were price transparency rules that were put in place uh, by which hospitals such as Mass General and others around the country are supposed to um, put information on what most common procedures cost. Mm -hmm. um, and many hospitals don't do it. It's great that Mass General does. Yeah. It's one of the fewer hospitals that are actually complying with the law. But when I look at it, it's so hard to understand and explain. You have uh, spent decades uh, establishing a relationship with patients, mm -hmm. uh, getting their trust. Doesn't something like this erode that trust? I am so glad you asked this question, and I'm going to tell you why. Because this really gets to a fundamental part of what I was talking about all along in terms of our strategy. First of all, yes, we are absolutely good with price transparency. This is important. It's also important to remember, before I get into this a little bit, what patients have to pay and what the total cost is to healthcare. So let's go back to this MRI and the transparency that we have relates to the whole system, it relates to Mass General, it relates to the Brigham. This is what it costs to do an MRI in a highest quality tertiary quaternary hospital. 
The technology, what it costs to do anything in these hospitals, is higher priced. That's just a fact. But here's another fact. We don't need to have patients have their MRIs in our system at Mass General all the time, or at the Brigham, or in any of these specialty hospitals. That is the importance of one of the things that we're doing, which is running enterprise-wide services in radiology, in pathology, in emergency medicine, in anesthesiology. And I'm gonna give you one quick example of how this works in radiology. Many patients, and I've been a clinician for many, many years, I have had patients come to see me at Mass General not because they need to have an MRI scan done at Mass General, but because I have been treating patients with rare diseases, I need the expertise of those highest level academic radiologists to read those films. I would much rather have those patients go to a much lower cost setting. I'd rather have them go to a community hospital. I would really rather have them go to ambulatory centers, which we are pushing very hard to keep opening up and developing as places to provide lower cost care. But I wasn't able to do that. Why? Because even though we had radiologists and, and radiology departments across the system, everything was different. They were on different PAC systems. They didn't actually do things together. So one of the first things that we did in terms of thinking about system integration was to have a common PAC system across the entire enterprise. So here's the goal. If you're a patient, and we're at that place now, if you're a patient and you live near Salem, you do not need to go to Mass General or the Brigham to get an MRI, which is going to cost more because it's in that setting. Now you can go to Salem Hospital. You could go to an ambulatory setting. And if it's a routine film, it'll be read locally. It'll be read by the right people. Mm -hmm. But if this is a patient with a, a rare disease, if this is a patient with a much more complex scan, that's just gonna be routed and that will go to the radiologist at the academic medical center. Why is that important? Because it gets to the first point I was making, is how do we take the best of being an academic healthcare system and deliver that kind of highest level care informed by research but lower the cost of care at the same time? And the answer is, we do enterprise services. We continue to push out routine care into the community, into the home, in these lower cost settings. So that's why when you look at this, you're seeing the tip of a very, very large spectrum of pricing all across the system, pricing in different locations, and that is the push that we're doing to get the care out that can be delivered closer to home. And, and that, I think, is a, is a really critical point to make. So you can always point to one test, you can point to one thing, but what's the overall value of what you're getting? And what's the overall value that, that can really be and must be provided on a system-wide level by doing the kinds of work that we're doing? That is what we need to get to. So we've talked a lot about patients and patient experience access and equity. I want to talk about physicians. Yes. I think everyone will join me in saying a big thank you to you and to the, the employees you lead who have helped us, I guess, strive through this difficult period in our history. How do you tackle physician burnout yep. 18 months into a pandemic? So, you know, uh, one of the joys of working in uh, a not-for-profit system like Mass General Brigham is that people are really driven to work there for mission. They are really driven to work there for mission. I came from New York uh, to train here many years ago with the intention of going back to New York City, and I stayed in Boston. Why did I stay in Boston? Because these hospitals are really magnificent places to work. So people are very mission-driven. They're driven to the kind of care that's provided. They're driven to the opportunities in research. They're driven to the opportunities in innovation. They want to they want to teach the next generation. They want to care for people in the communities. That's there. It's in, it's in the hallways. I feel it at every meeting. Mm -hmm. And then yet we have these incredible burdens on people and they've always been there. The administrative burden, how does that look? And then during COVID, it became so much more difficult. People felt personally threatened, their families were threatened, the burnout, the severity of this, that was all there. So I think there are many, many ways to deal with it. Some are structural, some are personal. A lot of burnout is local. 
uh, to, it's to create that environment in, the, in a local way where you come to every day, where you feel welcome and rewarded. So there are a couple of things to mention. Number one is structurally, we've done an, an enormous amount of work and we are continuing that work in lowering administrative burden. That's always been an issue and it, it hurts, I think. I know, are practicing clinicians more than ever before, so that's important. The second, and this gets directly to diversity, equity, and inclusion, is really providing among all of our caregivers, all of our physicians, many of whom are diverse, um, feeling that every one of our caretakers is welcome. They are welcome. They are looked at with respect. They are trusted. And that's part of a very large United Against Racism. Uh, I, I, it's more than a program. It's really embedded in everything that we're doing. And it involves health equity, the kind of community work that we talked about. But it also involves how we treat and value people, uh, its definite goals of what percent of diverse leadership we're going to have, how we train people to recognize bad behavior, uh, gender harassment, many, many things racist comments, the kind of things that so undermine a workforce and have definitely taken their toll on physicians. We talk a lot about childcare. So much of the workforce is female mm -hmm. and we look and see, and I've watched this with joy over the years, the number of promising new physicians who are coming along who are women. But again, we have to think about what the pandemic and what so much of this has meant in terms of childcare and homeschooling and who's doing what. We really have to pay particular attention to that. Women are more susceptible to burnout because of that added burnout. We need to take that burden on ourselves. The other thing I will highlight is behavioral health. So there is no time, I would say, in the history of, 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 of all of us and I've already mentioned this, when we've seen the impact of behavioral health, it's in disparities, in impact that it's had on our workforce, on our people, on our families, we've talked about access. But when we think about our caregivers, they too are under immense stress. And many have underlying, as, as with any workforce, behavioral health issues. So providing support for our workforce, for our caregivers, providing behavioral health support, thinking about what that means, these are all the kinds of things that we're working on. So it's value, it's, it's respect, mm -hmm. uh, it's resources, it's acknowledgement. Um, it's all of those things and reducing administrative burden. Perfect. So we are in the last bit in the lightning round. So I'm going to say a few words and you're going to respond with a few okay. words. So number one, most overhyped term in healthcare. The most over, well, there are so many. I have my, my favorite list of 10, but, but I think it's probably precision medicine. And it means so many different things. There's precision diagnostics, there's precision therapeutics. So I think it's overhyped. It needs okay. more definition. Perfect. Vaccine hesitancy. Yeah, this is the tyranny of misinformation and the uh, weaponization of science. Um, that's what I would say about that. Drug pricing. Drug pricing, we have to balance the incredible science, innovation, and excellence that has gotten us vaccines and so many other terrific cures. But what we also need to understand is we need access to these medications. These medications are incredibly long, hard roads to deliver, to manufacture, but we need to watch the pricing because we need to develop access for patients. One healthcare policy you want enacted. Uh, Policy enacted is this, technology is moving very fast. Our ability to deliver care is moving very fast. So I would like to see policies that relate to telehealth and our ability to deliver care. They need to be modernized. They need to be rapidly paced to really match the technology that we have. We are leaving people behind because of the policies that we have. We need reform, we need thought around that. And lastly, what do you think about the future of healthcare in 22 and beyond? The future of healthcare in 22 and beyond. Um, I think that what we need to do is take the kind of innovation and resiliency and learning that we've learned during this pandemic and then move forward very quickly. We came together as a city, as a state, as a community, as a scientific, a clinical community to fight the pandemic. But what we need to understand is that, that kind of resiliency to respond, there will be many more challenges to come. And unless we take that into ourselves, 
with our people, with our scientists, with our clinicians, with our politicians, with everybody. That's the challenge we have. We can do it. I'm no Christian, but amen to that. So with that, <laughs> I wanted to thank you so much, Dr. Kovanskin, for all of you um, uh, to come and listen to us today. Thank you. Thank you.